Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to our session. A um, couple of just housekeeping details. As all of you know, the session has been approved for 1.25 AIA and 1.25 AICP continuing education credits. For AIA, please ha uh, sign in at the back of the room and please write your name and AIA number clearly. Uh, for AICP attendees, you can report your attendance online at planning.org slash cm um, event number 19209 um, for a list of all sessions and tours from CNU 20. If you have any questions about that, I can't help you, <laughs> but maybe someone else can. Oh, do you want, uh, do you want the fellow to make the switch? Yeah, just go ahead. I, okay. I'm, I'm... All right, because he's, he's back. All right, thank you. Um, here are some other required slides from the AIA, which I'll go through very quickly. You may already have seen these earlier today. This regards the continuing education credits. Here is the course description, which you've seen in the program. Here are the lear learning objectives. If anybody wants to read the learning objectives, I'll be happy to make them available to you <laughs> after the discussion. Our panel today will address the question of what new urbanism and historic preservation can learn from one another, using case studies that offer professionals in both fields opportunities to share insights and explore areas for future collaboration. Specifically, our panel will consider the philosophical and procedural parallels between the coding and guidance of development over time in traditional neighborhood developments, or TNDs, and the definition and management of historic districts over time. Seaside, Florida, recognized as the first new urbanist TND, celebrated its 30th anniversary in 2011, which means that it has become eligible under some jurisdictions for nomination as a historic district. What would be the implications of such a designation for Seaside? Would preservationists have a different approach to questions of maintenance restoration and new construction than what has guided its growth so far? Would historic designation be advantageous or potentially damaging? Reversing that proposition, established historic districts have already become the sites of new urbanist projects in the form of new development adjacent to districts, overlay plans on existing cities, or infill programs within historic districts. How might the principles and tools of new urbanism be applied in a historic setting? And what would be the likely agreements or conflicts between urban planners and preservation authorities? These questions raise issues about the parallels and divergences of the two fields and their potential for either collaboration or conflict. As a native Floridian myself, born in Miami and raised in Coral Gables, one of the things I can tell you is that preservation awareness came relatively late to this state. Mind you, in Florida, we consider anything historic if it is more than 15 minutes old. The lower two-thirds of the state having been settled mostly after 1900 and its greatest growth after 1950. But there are places that Floridians consider historic, either in the strict sense of that word or because of their artistic quality or both. Addison Meisner's buildings on Worth Avenue and Palm Beach, which you see here, are familiar examples of what Floridians might consider historic, even though they date only from the 1920s. My hometown, Coral Gables, was a planned suburb in the 1920s with its principal buildings designed in a Mediterranean revival style. From the beginning, the town had an architectural review board that protected the town's best residential fabric and distinctive landscape over the decades. But the intimate scale of the original downtown area has been overwhelmed by visually dissonant high-rise office and apartment buildings. Actually, the ones you see here are by far not the worst. The main preservation issue here is not so much the survival of the older buildings, but the loss of their character and context. Overdevelopment is often the price of success, as sought-after neighborhoods discover that the scenic and historic values that made them desirable in the first place are threatened by rapid growth. 
On the other hand, the Art Deco district in Miami Beach shows how preservation activity itself can add sufficient value to drive the restoration of an entire neighborhood. The area, a local preservation district placed on the National Register of Historic Places in the 1970s, is known for its Art Deco hotels of the 1920s, 30s, and 40s, and has become the most stylish place in the state, thanks to Barbara Kapitman and her followers. But that success also exacted a price. One might say that one monoculture was replaced by another, wealthier one. Perhaps a happier outcome was achieved here in West Palm Beach. Last year on our panel on this subject, Anthea Gianotis explained how the master plan for West Palm Beach by Dwayne Platter, Zyberg and Company, in consultation with the city and county planning agencies and local preservation groups, included a program to spur development in the decaying downtown of the city while incentivizing preservation of local landmarks and historic districts, some 16 historic districts in this city. A citywide form-based code allowed the transfer of development rights from historic properties to adjacent sites, thereby encouraging the preservation of schools, churches, and other private, um, uh, public and private historic buildings. The city's preservation ordinances were relatively weak, but with the form-based code and the preservation program working together, pedestrian-oriented, walkable, mixed-use development proceeded alongside significant restoration programs for valued civic, cultural, commercial, and residential properties. This kind of collaboration between new urbanist planners and historic preservationists is what we want to examine today. One might ask why, the, why this has become an issue. Let's look at a little bit of history. In the old days, architects both restore, restored old buildings and designed new ones. It was considered a single professional activity. Leon Battista Alberti wrote in his 15th century treatise that an architect called upon to carry forward the work begun by another should continue the original design rather than change it or impose his own new ideas. There was no sense or a sense of obligation that the conditions of the present demanded a different architecture to distinguish the contemporary from the historic. Rather, it was possible for a project like the Campidoglio in Rome or the Louvre in Paris to continue to evolve in more or less the same style for three or four centuries before achieving the form we see today. In the early 20th century, the firm of Perry, Shaw, and Hepburn restored or reconstructed dozens of 18th century buildings in Williamsburg, Virginia, and also built the new town center called Merchant Square in the same style. The restoration work informed the design of the new structures, and designing new buildings in the same style actually also informed the restoration in rather interesting ways. Architecture, urbanism, and historic preservation were a single discipline with a common cultural outlook. After the Second World War, an anti-historical modernism drove these activities into separate professions. Faced with the massive losses, such as the demolition of Pennsylvania Station, in New York City, for example, preservationists turned their attention to what we might call modernist prevention. The decade-long battle to prevent the construction of a skyscraper atop Grand Central Terminal was finally won in 1978 with the U.S. Supreme Court's decision upholding the Landmarks Preservation Commission's authority to limit private development related to designated landmarks, and so the tower was not built. <coughs> Similar tower proposals were declined by the commission in the following decades, but in 2001, the same commission voted unanimously to approve the skyscraper above Joseph Urban's 1929 classical Hearst building, which you see here, to the design of Norman Foster. What had been denounced in 1968 as a, quote, aesthetic joke, unquote, that's from the brief filed before the Supreme Court, was now seen by the chairman of the commission as, quote, a completion of the landmark, unquote. This marked a significant change in the way preservationists viewed the relation between historic and contemporary architecture. The same commission also approved additions to three McKim Mead and White classical masterpieces that in the view of many, myself included, 
decontextualized these landmarks, enforcing a radical disconnection between their historical character and the new architecture which now dominated their appearance. These New York examples are not unusual. Indeed, an aesthetic of contrast pervades much of the preservation field today. How did this reversal of the original preservation battles come about? We have to remember that historic preservation reflects how contemporary people and architects perceive the past. If historical architecture is considered relevant to contemporary design, those who restore and those who design new things will be in alignment. If historical architecture, on the other hand, valuable as document is seen as valuable as documentation of the past, and seen, therefore, as having nothing to teach us today, it will be isolated, both temporally and spatially. The architectural styles before modernism will be considered over and unrepeatable, sequestered within academically defined periods. Pre-modern buildings and neighborhoods will be isolated from those based on the antithetical concepts of modern urbanism. If they cannot be separated in space, they will be separated in appearance leading to radical distinction between adjacent historic and new construction. The grassroots of the preservation movement still holds the former view, meaning the view of continuity uh, uh, between historic and new architecture, while the professional elite in the field tends to hold the latter view, enforcing contrast as the default setting and causing a serious split in the ranks within the preservation movement today. The Venice Charter of 1964 and the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation of 1977 lend authority to this temporal and spatial isolation between the historic and the contemporary. The standards, as many of you know, require that new features or construction in historic settings be differentiated from the historic fabric, but also compatible with it. Differentiated, compatible. Yes, no, small, big sort of an interesting, slightly contradictory standard. This has been widely, though not always, interpreted to require a stylistic contrast between new and old to satisfy the differentiation, while preserving similarities of massing and horizontal alignments of windows and cornice lines to provide continuity, or compatibility. The National Park Service itself promoted the confusion by using projects like this one to illustrate how the standards should be complied with resulting in hundreds of similar, similarly appalling insensitive additions to historic buildings in the name of preservation and at the expense of the conservation of historic architecture in the fullness of its context and character. Not only have some preservation programs actively promoted new modernist structures in contrast with historical settings, in many cases they have denied permission for new traditional construction, something nearly every traditional architect has experienced. This is illustrated, again, in the New York City Landmarks Commission staff response to this proposal to build a new, not a restored, but a new elevation for a Georgian Revival apartment house in Greenwich Village whose ground floor had been insensitively modernized in the 1960s. The architect was told the only acceptable approach would be to restore the existing wooden curtain wall or create a contemporary design, quote unquote, but in no case would an elevation conforming to the style of the building be approved. This position, justified by reference to the Secretary's standards, would over time have the effect of diminishing the character of the entire district. Unfortunately, it is by no means limited to New York, where indeed it has been eased in recent years. I should say in fairness, the Commission has evolved since this project and uh, has been much more balanced uh, in this matter. But it has become typical across the country, and by the way, it's also typical in Europe today. An important exception is Nantucket, Massachusetts, which is guided by its own standards in a book published in 1995 called Building with Nantucket in Mind, authored by the Towns Historic District Commission. This planning document is a kind of form-based code that instructs designers how to build additions or new buildings in the district in a way that continues the local building culture. While the community had been heavily impacted by development pressures, the code has succeeded in preserving much of the character of the place in the same way that the code of a TND aims to guide growth and change over time in a place like Seaside. The Historic Preservation League of Oregon just last year published guidelines for new infill development in historic districts, 
explicitly departing from the narrow interpretation of the standards, requiring visual consonants and proscribing gratuitous contrast. Without framing the judgment solely in terms of style, its principles set standards for new construction in districts, something the Secretary's standards, written to govern additions to individual structures, was never intended to do. Like the Nantucket program, the Oregon document recognizes that preservation guidelines should be place-specific, grounded in the building culture of the setting, rather, in ter rather than in terms of what some people might think is either good design or, worse yet, the architecture of our time, which is the phrase you keep hearing. Now, finally, the National Park Service last year clarified this a little bit, reissuing its primary document on additions and new construction at historic sites, providing for the first time illustrations that show infill and additions in the same style as the historic structures. In other words, avoiding stylistic contrast as a means of providing differentiation. I'll just note because the illustration is small. because um, they're stylistically compatible. And so here we have the Park Service illustrating compliance with the standards by showing people that, in fact, stylistic contrast is not required, at least by the Park Service. So now it is official. Those in the field who mandate new construction in historic districts in a contrasting style can no longer justify their actions by citing the standards though this clarification has yet to trickle down to the state and local levels in many places. So style battles go on in places like Richmond, Charleston, and Portland, just to cite a few. Why is this important? Because one of the cardinal principles of the Charter for the New Urbanism is to promote harmony and continuity with valued historic urban fabric and landscapes. While the bias in favor of contrasting style did not necessarily affect decision making at the urban scale, it did have the potential, and in a few cases the actual consequence, of negating the objective of new urbanist town planners and architects to stitch together rather than isolate new and historic segments of the built environment. By opening up the restrictive interpretations of some programs, these two fields can indeed work together to promote conservation ethic, integrating new and historic buildings for a truly diverse and sustainable urban future. As all of you know, new urbanism arose in parallel with historic preservation and at the same time. They really are two movements that came out of the same crisis. Um, as a protest movement against the land use, transportation, development, and construction patterns of modern urbanism. In central cities, the tower and slab blocks isolated in open space, and in the suburbs, single use zoning, the primacy of automobile over pedestrian traffic, and the rest of the low density development we know as sprawl. The key to seaside success was the urban code and the architectural code, two sets of instructions that directed the town's growth in the absence of a traditional building culture. The code envisioned a diversity of housing types, sizes, and characters from the beginning. But the success of the place has meant that the actual cost of property has progressively moved up the economic scale leaving the earlier, more modest houses vulnerable to substantial additions or replacement as teardown properties for larger, more expensive houses. In other words, seaside is gentrifying. What will happen to seaside in the future? Will the codes continue to govern the town, allowing it to evolve according to its own DNA, as it were? Um, these two houses, designed by uh, fourth-year uh, design studio students just this semester at the University of Notre Dame were part of a project where the class went to Seaside, spent some time there, and tried to design houses of their own uh, using the architectural and urban code. Uh, so obviously this could continue. Or will success and increased demand lead to teardowns, oversized additions, and the loss of its character? These are questions Seaside and other traditional neighborhood developments share with many historic districts that have seen their desirability as places to live drive prices and costs out of the reach of the intended population. In the end, new urbanism and historic preservation have a common objective, the creation and maintenance of a humane and sustainable built environment. As we can see right here in West Palm Beach, the two together may be able to accomplish more than either one can alone. 
It seems unarguable that the two fields should recognize their common aims as well as their divergent interests and work more closely together to achieve larger social aim of beautiful, sustainable, and just cities. Here to help us understand these issues in greater depth are John Massengale and Pratt Cassidy, and I'll just mention quickly, uh, uh, introduce them to you. Um, John Massengale has won awards for architecture, urbanism, architectural history, and historic preservation from organizations and publications ranging from Progressive Architecture and Metropolitan Home to the National Book Award Foundation, the first architecture book ever to be nominated for a uh, National Book Award. Uh, the Anglo-American Suburb? New York 1900. New York 1900, excuse me. You didn't include that <laughs> title. And several chapters of the American Institute of Architects. He was a founding member of the CNU. He is the chair of the New York chapter, CNU, New York, and a former board member of the Institute of Classical Architecture and Classical America, and the Federated Conservationists of Westchester County. Pratt Cassidy is director of the Center for Community Design and Preservation in the College of Environment and Design at the University of Georgia. Pratt teaches graduate courses in historic preservation, landscape architecture, and planning. For 10 years, he served as executive director of the National Alliance of Preservation Commissions, and now his University of Georgia office houses the administrative functions of that alliance. He's an expert on historic districts. He has provided leadership for several Your Town, the Rural Institute on Design workshops, as well as working closely with the National Trust on preservation leadership training and other programs. Pratt holds a BS in horticulture from Mississippi State, an MS in public and urban affairs from Georgia State, and a certificate in conservation of traditional structures from the Institute for Advanced Architectural Studies in the United Kingdom. So uh, with that introduction, I will ask Pratt to continue the program. Let me get out of your way. Good afternoon. So what can we learn from historic district districting? That's a hard word to say. Perhaps isn't a word at all. But the evolution of local historic districts truly has a long and rich heritage in this country. But there are some distinctions that need to be made today about where it came from and especially where it seems to be going. The evolution of the concept of drawing lines around areas and treating them differently, one from another, some say go back to the very beginning of the Anglo invasion of our country uh, in Jamestown. But for today's purposes, I don't think we need to go back that far for the lessons or the connections to new urbanism. Is historic district management onerous, like some have called it? Is it protecting architecture, but not protecting essential character? Does it lead to gentrification? Is that always bad? These questions and many others have plagued the preservation movements from its uh, very beginnings, when in fact, most of these occurrences are demographic and real estate phenomena. This past year, Euclid versus Ambler turned 85. So the concept of making sure that economic investment is prote protected from selfish or egotistical outsiders making changes in local districts was firmly established in the Supreme Court decision. This was not the beginning of zoning, but it was the watershed decision to allow all sorts of districts to be established and corroborated under the U.S. Constitution. Charleston's 1931 ordinance is touted as the first locally zoned district. The BAR, the Board of Architectural Review in Charleston, was established to protect the appearance and appeal of the district, not necessarily the use. And by golly, it worked. Some might say, too well. This was occurring as architectural thinkers were addressing the loss of heritage globally. Concepts like recordation and definitions of cultural patrimony were firmly established in the charters that we've already heard about and their preambles by ICOMOS, the International Council of Monuments and Sites, under the auspices now of UNESCO. 
Later in the Venice Charter, the ideas of districting, authenticity, heritage education, the World Heritage List, historic communities, and cultural tourism all were further refined, and each subsequent charter got a little closer to what we're thinking about district character. However, historic preservation in America has always been reactionary. It hasn't been forward thinking. It's a grassroots movement brought on by domestic situations that had policies and programs emerge from those negative situations. In 1966, with the publication of With Heritage So Rich from a conference uh, of the U.S. Conference of Mayors, With Heritage So Rich um, was first published, and when it was published, um, it actually, the, the title itself came from the Book of Common Prayer, and it came from the prayer, prayer for the nation. That kind of religious connection may not be politically correct today for something as important as this uh, seminal work. But in the case of this particular book, I think it's undeniable that that connection is appropriate. If any secular publication, oops, we need another power source, Stephen. Okay. Um, with, with this particular book, there. The connection made sense because it has become the very Bible of the American preservation movement from the beginning. This spawned Mr. Nixon, Mr. Nixon's National Historic Preservation Act of 1966, and there have been substantive amendments to that act in the 70s and in the 80s. Most notably, it was this congressional validation of the registration process established in the National Register of Historic Places. This process was to be administered by state historic preservation offices. This was a national coordinated planning process, warts and all. It serves as the basis for preservation mediation and incentive one of carrots and one of sticks. In order to get most incentives and to protect insensitive federal intervention with historic resources, you have to be on the National Register. Some states have mirrored the National Register with state processes and registers that are local that implement the same strategies at the state and local level in environmental review and in incentives. But back to the local level. It was a court decision in the New, New Orleans Vucare District, the French Quarter, that I think corroborated and uh, a judge in Louisiana put words together that were, were quite beautiful. And I think they sum up both what uh, new urbanism wants to do and what historic preservation wants to do. It's quite eloquent. It broadened the concept for regulatory action. And in many cases, this predating of the landmark decision that you've heard about with Penn Central and Grand Central Terminal, um, we saw the jurisprudence in Louisiana, if one can call Louisiana's decisions jurisprudence, <laughs> uh, that they gave us a quite valuable and beautiful phrase, tout ensemble. This phrase, I think, sums up everything all together, how things come together and combine to cause an effect. The Italians have a, have a beautiful name for it, too. It's l'ambiente, the ambience of a place. Not just the historic resources, but the character and the feel. When districts are placed in the National Register, they can become protected later by local zoning and design review districts, or those districts can be established before those properties are listed in the National Register. In Valdosta, Georgia, they use their National Register districts to serve as the core of their local district. But rightly so, they think that the area between their National Register districts 
serves as a prenatal version of a historic district. They consider these areas in between, if they are ever going to be eligible for preservation, they need protection now. They need design guidelines and the local review process so that they can be protected. If you look on the map, the dark areas on the map are their National Register districts. The larger red boundary is their local design review district. There's quite a distinction between those things. The National Alliance of Preservation Commissions was created in, uh, coincidentally in Charleston, South Carolina exactly 50 years after their ordinance was passed. Now over 30 years later, the NAPC works as the lead organization in the country for educating, advocating, and training for the 2,500 Historic Preservation Commissions and Design Review Boards and those other appointed boards that do design review across the country. There's a postcard in your chair that talks about one of their major training efforts that will be coming up next month. The National Alliance has conducted something they call CAMPS, Commission Assistance and Mentoring Program. Across the nation, they have worked to level the playing field and make decisions of commissions match local guidelines, match the intention of local, local planning, without mandating a specific decision that is made. They are improving the decision-making process without dictating the decisions. Over 7,000 local commis commissioners have been trained in nearly 100 different locations. So all of this comes together. The National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 spawned something that was rather straightforward, and that's a, the preservation planning process. It's now practiced by 53 state historic preservation offices, the tribal historic preservation offices, the federal agencies, and the certified local governments, those local governments who have commissions and have a local design review program. Currently, there are 1,871 of those. It's a four-step process it's that, like I said, was rather simple. It's one of identification survey and inventory, evaluation, which talks about the integrity or the condition of buildings and the significance or their associative historical value. Then it talks about registration, or as we tend to call it, designation, either on those national, state, or local registers, and ultimately protection. That's where the incentives, the regulatory language, the mediated negotiations, and the democratic review by locally appointed quasi-judicial boards occurs. Let's look at why this process was important and why it was necessary at all, and why it has resulted in some of the best innovations that I feel we've seen hap uh, see happen in cities. With an attitude among architects and developers, who thought downtown should be slip covered like this advertisement shows, which is from Architectural Record Magazine, to make a fine Italianate commercial building into a modern aluminum asset. <laughs> One of those right place, right time moments came with the creation in the late 70s of a renewed effort at downtown revitalization across America. A broad and yet another simple approach was developed when the National Main Street program was created. This program addresses the vacancy and abandonment issues that were happening in the nation, especially in small and medium town, uh, medium sized downtowns, but it was also happening in larger ones too. The Main Street approach is simple, and it's very simple to remember. It spells the word DOPER, D O P E R. The D is for design which is pretty straightforward. The O is organization, which is organizational structure. P is promotion, which is essentially management and marketing. And the ER is economic restructuring. That's making downtown learn, downtowns learn lessons from the mall 
so that they can compete with them equally. So that they, uh, since at that time, the malls were draining most, most of the businesses from downtown. Now the Main Street programs have a proven track record and there are similar programs in Canada and Australia. Preservation also led the way in the early 80s with uh, using historic preservations as an energy saving method. This poster, although quite um, valid today, actually was a poster from the 80s. The words sustainable and green had not even been butchered and overused at the time. It was all about energy, gasoline. It was a, during that time that President Carter told everyone to turn the lights off and wear sweaters at home. Perhaps no program in preservation has had more substantive and tangible results than has been offered up through the tax incentive program. These were parts of several tax acts that Congress passed in reauthorizations throughout the 80s. The revenue neutral program required but a few things. The first was that each building had to be listed in the National Register of Historic Places as contributing. Then rehabilitation occurred and the rehabilitation work had to meet the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehab. Even that mysterious standard nine and its evolving interpretations. The other requirement was that the buildings had to be income producing. It could not be your own residence or a building used for religion. However, in Michigan, the federal tax credits were enhanced by a state level tax credit program. This program worked for homeowners. So in combination, the creation of the program in 1999 kick-started a, a tremendous amount of reinvestment activity, this building in Detroit, for example. But it wasn't just urban areas, it was rural areas too. Within a few years, many owner-occupied as well as those commercial projects were making good use of the tax credits. A special report about Michigan's economic impact said that between 2001 and 2005, private investment spurred over $902 million to Michigan's economy for a total economic impact of more than $1.93 billion. This is in the early 21st century in Michigan and it resulted in the creation of 22,000 jobs. That's nearly $2 billion invested in just five years far surpassing the cumulative investments of the past 30 years by simply using those federal tax credits. But probably no tax credit project in Florida has been more impressive than the Fountain Blue Hotel. When the Fountain Blue Resort Hotel was constructed, it became famous for luxury and design. It became a massive rehabilitation project with the help from, a federal, from the Federal Historic Preservation Tax Credit Program it helped the hotel keep its reputation. The $317 million project repaired and improved the two historic sections of the resort. The 1954 Morris Lapidus main section and the 1959 Herbert Mathis Tower. The Lapidus portion is a huge crescent-shaped structure that's 11 stories tall. In the New York Times, Morris Lapidus' obituary read like this. No American architect in the 20th century embraced more flamboyantly the flagrantly, the flagrantly commercial aspect of design than did Morris Lapidus, who titled his, autobi his autobiography, Too Much is Never Enough. <laughs> Lapidus died in 90, uh, at 98 in 2001 and had been derided but later praised for designing some of South Florida's gaudiest, glitziest, and most glamorous hotels, including the Fountain Blue, the Americana, and the Eden Rock. His style was mockingly called Miami Beach French, and critics scorned the obscene panache with which, created, with which he created such palaces of kitsch, 
many of which have already been raised. The Mathis Tower is 14 stories high and is distinguished by a cheese wall, an exterior wall pierced by circular openings. However, as Stephen said, the South Beach preservationists who loved Art Deco, and they voted, uh, were none too pleased at the construction of this monster. However, the same tools that its construction spawned, namely the Art Deco district and its stringent design standards, led to the eventual rehabilitation of the building. That's great irony. Recognizing that this was an important piece of South Florida's tourist economy and history led to its sensitive rehabilitation. State after state, including Florida, have looked at historic preservation and seen those services that are provided by economists as valuable as convincing the public that preservation is a good investment. Florida Center for Governmental Responsibility, the University of Florida, partnered with the Center for Urban Policy Research at Rutgers and produced a study that showed incredible impact, just like in Michigan. Uh, uh, preservation contributed $6.3 billion annually to the state. They created jobs here, income to Florida residents, and an increase in the great gross state product. It increased state and local taxes and increased in-state wealth, whether it was through heritage tourism, historic rehabilitation, history museums, Main Street programs, or the creation of local districts. I like to think that this network, a network that good lessons can be learned from, should be called the preservation power grid. And I think the lesson to be learned here is that no station is left unmanned, whether it is federal, state, regional, local, or as I call it, less than local, public, private for-profit, private not-for-profit, or quasi-governmental. You have an organization or a set of individuals who are advocates for that particular approach to preservation. Covering the ground with professionals and volunteers at the local, state, and federal level gave a safety net for buildings that were worthy of preservation. This preservation power grid works. Innovations continue to happen, however, in historic preservation. It doesn't stay still. One of the new kids on the block is a process called, historic, is called heritage areas. How many of you have heard of heritage areas? A show of hands. Not so many people yet. Heritage areas really reflect what is happening internationally. It's a process that recognizes the grand variety of larger than the typical historic district. And it's made up of tangible and intangible resources, natural, cultural, and historic resources too. However, it takes a special act of Congress to create one. But I think what we'll see in the near future is that local plans and state plans will start picking up on this heritage area concept and begin planning in that direction. That kind of inclusion, I think, is one that will accommodate new urbanist areas. So that leaves us with some questions to ponder. Is the local overlay district the most effective tool in managing change in traditional developments that we have? I think this is especially true for demolition protection and the prevention of teardowns as we heard earlier. It also helps deal with those demographic changes like gentrification. The other question is, what is the ultimate result of design review as a protective strategy? Is the architectural vocabulary preserved, but the district feel lost? Another question is, can the Reg National Register listing alone be appropriate? Can the recognition and the associative history related to that be right for new urbanist projects? 
Clearly, the historical impact of Seaside is noteworthy for changing the face of development across America. I think that's worthy of listing in the National Register. But how will our state historic preservation offices, and especially the National Park Service, deal with this? As you heard Stephen say, in the past it's been rather clumsy. They've been vacillating between uh, approaching a more modernist look at additions and, um, and uh, adjacent structures without really understanding what this is going to mean when it's applied to structures that are of the recent past. But I think the tools will work. I think the tools are there to be used. And I certainly think that lessons are to be learned. Thank you. Thank you. So here at CNU 20, Seaside is obviously a place we know. Uh, I was an early town architect there. And um, um, it's influenced uh, American development and building in many ways since then, uh, even American movie making. Hmm. Uh, and it's um, something that, that was uh, it was the first um, f modern form base code, and uh, some some of uh, we new urbanists look at form base codes quite reverently, and of course <laughs> we have a leader who uh, uh, has been on a mission for many things. One of them being form base codes, and uh, it's an interesting. When I arrived at Seaside, the winter population was six people. <laughs> and um, uh, there were two houses um, next to each other on, on a street, uh, but there were no um, houses actually across the street from each other. And um, <coughs> there, were, there was really only one street on the eastern side of town. Uh, you can see it in, uh, on, the, uh, on the right. Um, almost going off the screen. And the, uh, the, um, the trees were actually down around this height. There was nothing above about three feet. And so uh, when progressive architecture went there and wrote about all this great urbanism, they were really putting a lot of faith in the future because uh, they're, they're, it's, there were just a group of isolated buildings sitting in three-foot shrubs. There really was no, no urbanism. But um, there was uh, developed in this um, an urban code and an, and an architectural code. And as it happens, um, I had a minor contribution to this of um, I wrote a book uh, with Bob Stern called The Anglo-American Suburb which was about planned suburbs. And there was a, um, uh, and, and the Anglo-American suburb was used at the seaside charrette. But it also, it led to Bob Stewart getting his first subdivision job, which was a small subdivision on Staten Island on the uh, Ernest Flagg estate. Uh, Ernest Flagg was a great architect 100 years ago in New York. And he owned um, a house on Staten Island on the top of Toad Hill, which is the tallest point between uh, Maine and Florida along the coast. And um, Bob had never done anything like this. And uh, because I had helped him on the Anglo-American suburb, he put me on that job. And we started writing a code, uh, even though um, even though uh, Bob's office was designing all the houses, we started writing a code. And Bob would go off to the Hamptons for the weekend and come back with the, with the code, and there would be sand on it, and there would be words that would start one place on the page, and they'd go around the page, around the page, and then around to the back of the page. Mm 
And it just got longer and longer and more complicated. And it got down to the level of things like um, uh, no ducks on mailboxes. <laughs> and um, yeah, I happened to be talking to this former student of Bob's he'd introduced me to named Andres Duani. And he said, oh, I'm working on a code in Florida. Can you send it to me? And um, I'd, I'd like to see it. And I sent it down to him. And Andres being Andres, pretty quickly realized something that Bob and I hadn't figured out on our own, which was that it's much better to tell people what they can do than what they can't do. And so instead of saying no ducks on mailboxes, no aluminum siding, no vinyl siding, he said, we'll tell them uh, wood shingles, wood siding, uh, brick or stone, or stucco. And um, they, of course, had Robert and uh, Daryl and uh, Andres and Liz, of course, had been looking at the local houses. And they wanted to, um, uh, they wanted people to, to build the local houses, and they weren't going to build them themselves. And so they developed a code coding um, those houses. And they discovered that um, there were only a few roof pitches that those houses used, and that um, on the porches, which were an important part of the houses, the uh, roof pitch was different. And um, they wanted to encourage street life, and so they required um, a percentage of the house to, to have um, a, a, a porch along the frontage and so on and so forth. And they developed this quite simple code, which on two pages, this is the urban code, there's also the one page architecture code, um, made it easy to design a, um, a local uh, house and difficult not to. Um, although I should say one thing that, that's been forgotten since then is that the first line of this code said, this code may be overridden on the basis of architectural merit which is something that's dropped out of the smart code. That, you know, when um, Frank Lloyd Wright came to your town, Frank Lloyd Wright was not required to follow this code. Um, and then the, the other aspect of Seaside that's, that's relevant to this discussion is that, um, as, so here's, the, here's one of the houses. This is the house that Robert and Daryl lived in. Um, this is the type of house they were trying to encourage. Uh, and this is uh, Stephen Hall's building, um, which shows it, how low the scrub was and how few houses there were, even at the time that they started to, to um, build the downtown. Uh, and then this is uh, the original street. Uh, years later, after the, the three-foot scrub had grown up, so that some of the tree, some of the streets even have canopies. But what became uh, the the other way that this is relevant to the discussion today is um, the town worked its way street by street from the east to the west, from uh, there from the right to the left, and um, the. Buildings down on the on the right end, uh, a lot sold for ten thousand uh, dollars. Robert set up a shack where he sold uh, shrimp, sangria, and lots, and he was selling a lot more shrimp and sangria than lots. But by the time he got down to the other end, where the houses are by Aldo Rossi and Bob Stern and people like that, lots were lots on the beach were selling for a million dollars. And so from the east end of the town to the west end of the town, there's quite a difference. Um, the, the east end of the town, the houses are small. They have no insulation um, very often. They um, will sometimes have exposed, the exterior siding will be exposed on the interior. They were small because they were cheap, and Robert wanted to encourage um, you know, if you, if you build a small house, you can afford better materials in the same budget than if you build a big house, and he wanted to encourage that. But by the time they got down to the west end of town, this house by uh, Robert Stern Architects, uh, you know, it has an elevator and a, a wine cellar and uh, all sorts of things that 
just were never envisioned in the original Seaside. And um, Seaside in the beginning was thought to be a place where poor architects would be able to retire and <laughs> hang out. And um, it became a place where if you were a socially ambitious southerner, you wanted to have a house here. And it really became very expensive. And so, of course, now there's some friction. Um, Gary Brewer, a partner at Bob Stearns, uh, who designed this, this house, feels quite strongly that it's unfair that lots there are so small <laughs> and that his clients should not be forced to endure, you know, having only a 4,000 square foot house. That they should be able to combine lots and build a 12,000 square foot house. And, and there is, um, you know, talk of teardowns and making the eastern end, ed, edge of uh, Seaside a historic district. Um, but it's also relevant in that, as I said, Andres has gone on from this time to develop the smart code. Nobody knew when there's, there's a story of Robert Davis hiring um, Andres, which is a little too long for this meeting, but what the story shows is that Robert really had no idea who Liz and Andres were when he hired them. And they had no urban design in their background. They had no code writing in their background. And there was really no reason to think that not only Andres, but that Andres and Liz were going to go on to do the things that they did, including writing um, the smart code, which is really a very um, powerful work of coding. And the smart code, uh, I think you. I think most of the audience knows um, what the smart code does: the infill and the regulating plans and the transect and all that stuff, and uh, how you apply it in different transect zones, and it gives you the setback and the form and the thoroughfares and um, et cetera. But we used it in um, Damariscotta, Maine, uh, a town of 2,500 people, which coincidentally has two prominent new urbanists who grew up there. And um, uh, Damariscott is a beautiful little town on uh, Route 1 in Maine, which is the main uh, north-south road for a, lot of the, for a lot of the coast, and which in the summer is extremely busy with people going up and down. And um, they've had issues of um, coming under assault from big box and chain stores and that sort of thing, um, assaulting the edges of town and draining the center of town. Um, and so even though they only had, um, uh, 10 years ago they had no zoning. And uh, then they passed zoning and then they took it away again and then they passed it again. <laughs> um, but. Um, through the influence of the two new urbanists who grew up there, um, they hired Bill Dennis to do a charrette, uh, paid for by the Orton Foundation, uh, which was a two and a half year visioning and design process. And we were hired after that, um, I say we, uh, Robert Orr and I, and uh, Sandy Sorlene and Beth Delavalli, um, we were hired after that to code the visioning and the design that, that Bill had done. And um, the situation was that there was a developer on the edge of town who um, had a, a piece of land, a few hundred acres, that he wanted to develop. He had the idea that a smart code would enable him to develop it at greater density. And so he said, I'll pay for the smart code, which is not easy for a town of 2,500 people. And um, we did it in three parts. His piece of land, the, uh, the Route 1 outside of Main Street, and Route 1 and the, and the village center uh, on Main Street. And most of the people don't even realize it, but uh, their little center is a national historic district. and. Um, they, but they had passed um, in their zoning um, guidelines for um, development in which they called for uh, 
New England style zoning, or New England style building for everyone other than people building the private houses. And so they already had um, rules in place to encourage a particular form of building. And um, we uh, uh, took those rules and we developed a three-part um, um, set of, in, um, a part that was part of the smart code, a part that, an appendix that were incentive standards and an appendix that were guidelines. Um, and we took the architecture of Damascata, which is uh, primarily in the tradition of the 18th century Damascata architecture, and um, we developed from it a, um, a set of principles, which in the first part, the part that applied to everybody, uh, were, were pretty short and pretty close to the standard form-based code uh, that you find in the, in the smart code. Uh, the only thing that we, that we did was we identified that the, um, the average building in Damascata uh, on, the, um, on the street is almost always a, a single block, maybe with a small wing, uh, and either with the, with the gable uh, parallel to the road or perpendicular to the road. And, um, and the, the block itself usually has symmetrical windows with a certain spacing uh, center doorway, et cetera. And so we, we added a little bit of that to the, to the first part. And to the, um, to the second part, which was for both um, commercial development and um, commercial development and um, uh, speculative development of houses, uh, not somebody building their own house, we, we took their existing guidelines and made them stricter about um, uh, how the windows would be composed in the wall and that sort of thing. And we, with Marianne's position, uh, permission, we took um, details from, uh, out of her do and don't book um, with things like the, the infamous pork chop that's always discussed by new urbanists. And, um, and then in the final part, we um, it, uh, standards and guidelines, we said that, uh, you know, if you, the commercial builder, you, the um, um, uh, speculative builder, will follow these incentives and guidelines, we will expedite your permitting process. So that um, it, later on in the book, we actually have um, uh, actual plates out of Asher Benjamin's um, book because there are actually Asher Benjamin houses in Damariscotta and Asher Benjamin uh, details in the houses. And, um, and we took things out of the American Vignola. Um, this was not a heterodoxical town. We <laughs> took things out of the American Vignola and said, you know, this is the way you do the Ionic, this is the way you do the Tuscan. And if, if you, Mr. Builder, will do this, you'll, you know, we'll, we'll help you because this is what we want. Um, and so it, it took, um, th there is a straight line actually from the um, Code of Seaside to the Code of Damariscotta and along the way in there it is the, the, the historical standards of their national uh, registered downtown. And it, uh, one thing to add is that um, there are two types of New Ormid uh, architectural codes. Um, seaside is what Andres calls a constructional code, which is that it's, it's not about style. Um, it's more about a particular way of building for the town. And um, the other type is the type that Bob Stern, for example, uh, used at Celebration, which was a pattern book and a style code. So that if you build it at celebration, uh, when, you, when you pick out your lot, if you're the first person um, to buy a lot on that block, you choose from one of the six styles in use at celebration. 
But if you're the fourth person and some of those styles are already gone, you, um, there's, there's a forced diversity of styles. And um, um, it's, it's an eclectic approach that I know from my time working with Bob is exactly what he likes when he goes somewhere. And, and he himself is an eclectic designer and uh, Gary Brewer is an eclectic designer. My experience is that um, the constructional code, however, um, is, easier, is an easier way to get good results. Um, an example is uh, Steve Buzan's um, um, Provident, no, um, I can't think of the name. Alabama, not Providence, the other one. The Waters. Um, the Waters um, has a constructional code and um, Steve Muzan, this town architect, would go to the Waters and they would actually, uh, they, developed a, they developed a constructional code based on local precedent and they would, um, they would actually mock up a window and they would build it together and so that for the contractors it became a way of um, construction. And um, if you go to the waters, it's a very good result. And it's, um, I think that, that builders are more interested in how do you build things than, you know, um, looking something up in a style book and seeing the difference between uh, French Louisiana and um, American classic or, you know, whatever the styles are. So on to the questions. Thank you, John. Um, I would like to open up the floor to some questions, but first I'd like to ask a question of our two panelists and then I'd be happy to have questions from the audience. Um, I think it, it, it's fairly clear that all of the questions we've been addressing this afternoon are about managing change. They're about managing change looking forward in the case of planning a new community. They're all about managing change in a kind of retrospective way, if you will, when you're dealing with a historic district. In a case where you might have both historic properties and new construction happening together, which increasingly will happen now in existing cities, which is the focus of most new urbanism now is on existing cities and downtowns and so forth, or suburbs, uh, the inner suburbs from the 1920s or what have you. As these two fields begin to mesh, the question is how do these ways of managing change work together? And one of the things that I think came across in Pratt's presentation is that historic preservationists have 50, 60, 75 years of experience in figuring out what tools work in terms of incentives and codes and reviews and that sort of thing. New urbanism's been around now at most 30 years and also developing experience in what works, smart codes, form-based codes, pattern books, and so on. And I'd like to ask uh, Pratt and then John to just spend one minute or two minutes uh, talking about how you see the way in which these two disciplines or these two sets of experiences could actually dovetail and, and uh, give us new tools for managing changes moving forward. Sure. Um, one, of, one of the most exciting parts of local districts is that if they've been managing change for the past 30, 50, 80 years, then we should be seeing more compatible architecture appearing in those districts. Well, those buildings, those newer buildings under the old system would be considered non-contributing or non-historic. Some local governments are now trying to create new classifications and survey and inventory of non-contributing and non-historic yet part of the scene. And that compatibility factor raises their contribution to the district just by having a more traditional approach to fitting in than having that less traditional approach to fitting in. So I think that's a good move that we're creating um, a timeline mm -hmm. of uh, buildings that fit in early, buildings that didn't seem to fit in in the middle age of the modern movements, and now buildings that fit in a bit more. So I think there's going to be different tiers and different levels of protection for those compatible newer construction. Terrific. John. Um, 
This is the, the second year of this session led by Steve. And one thing we talked about last year was the architecture of place versus the architecture of time. Uh, for many years, um, preservation was um, led by academics and architects who were big believers in the architecture of time. And that, um, you know, historic architecture was historic, it was in the past, it's not what we do today. And so um, many of us have had, I mean, I've had the experience, and many of us have, of doing an addition to a historic building and having the State Historic Preservation say, office say, we can't tell the difference between your building and the old one, even though one, I mean, I'm picturing a building we did in which one building was stone, ours was, uh, was wood, and they said we can't tell <laughs> which is which. Um, and they required us to put a glass and steel connector between the two in order to get approval. And of course, um, somebody, uh, an architect who's a traditional designer, thinks that's blasphemous, you know, that it's, it's fights the <laughs> harmony of the edition, it fights what Alberti was saying. Um, and so, um, it, new urbanists have tried to make places that we call immersive contexts, and it's quite natural that when we go work in cities, we want to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. not, not, not contrast the new and the old, but make a place where people want to be. I, yeah. Can I have one sure. more thing? I think that that earlier assumption has led to the false conclusion that bad replication is better than good replication. <laughs> and that's clearly wrong. Uh, so I don't think that uh, the, the logic in the old argument that was coming out of the State Historic Preservation Office offices will work. Hmm. Well, one of the things that um, I've suggested is that if we start thinking of cities and towns not as collections of artifacts, things that are dead, but actually thought of them as like natural resources, like ecosystems or gardens that are things that are alive. I mean, how do you conserve a garden? How do you conserve a rainforest? You don't do that by saying no new plants, right? Uh, you conserve it by allowing it to continue to grow in the same way that it got to be the valuable thing that it is. And if we thought of our neighborhoods and cities as, say, a historic district that can have new buildings that 50 years from now will potentially be considered contributing. Because maybe the, the significance of that district didn't stop in 1845 or 1945 or 1955, whatever the uh, register nomination says. You know, one of the things that's interesting is I don't think the National Register has a process for updating nominations. No, it's very clumsy. So the idea that you define a historic district, and let's say it's in one of the early ones from, say, 1970-something, and in 1970-something, they thought the significance of this building or neighborhood was such and such. Okay, 40, 50 years out, we think the significance is something else or something more. So we have to have a way to go back and say, well, how do we, again, conserve over a longer time frame? I'd like to open up for uh, questions from the audience, if anybody would like to make a comment. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And it's obvious that it obviously has a life. And whenever I can, I add in the way that matches it, mm -hmm. in spite of, of this misguided vision of how to mismatch. Yeah. What's, what's really interesting, too, is that this historic district also has houses from different periods of time. Yes. And this freezing of it is, is also crazy. And, you know, after preserving, I, I came to the new urbanism through preservation. Mm -hmm. Good. And you can only save things for so long, and then you want to mend it, and you want to patch it, and you want to fix it. So the, the project becomes the whole city or the whole right. historic form, and, and that's what new urbanism is doing so brilliantly, mending the historic form. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm so thrilled with the way it's going. And I just want to, I guess I don't have a question. Uh, well, we'll accept that. I think, I think that's <laughs> we'll accept that on. as an endorsement. No, I think the real opportunity here is to see that these two movements that started as a protest against something are both coming together and converging, and they're still protesting against something, and we're actually protesting something that's, ironically, even within the movements themselves, there's still that sort of thing that uh, we have to sort of clear the way. Because, if, again, if we think of a, a, a district, 
And I alluded to this earlier, actually, the National Park Service has now admitted that the standards were never intended to guide the districts, but only individual buildings. If you think of a district as a kind of an ecosystem, it has to have a future. It has to have a future, and you have to guide it. You have to, it's like a garden. You have to irrigate it, you have to, and so forth. So I think there's a convergence here. New urbanism wants to create neighborhoods that are alive. Preservation wants to preserve neighborhoods that live and change and grow and have a future. And the way to do that is I think some of the tools that John and Pratt have discussed are there. I would encourage all of you, if you don't know, to take a look at the Oregon guidelines, Historic Preservation League of Oregon, hplo.org. I think you can find it or just Google that. Um, it's a really interest, those of you who are interested in district management, it's a really good step forward. Uh, one more comment, yes, sir. Ah, that's a good question. a very different idea of what you do with old buildings. Yes. And, and it, it's uh, what you talked about. You know, the old buildings are life, but it, they, in fact, don't have to be archaeological relics to scrape the paint and find out what color it is, but rather they're, they're just the start of the life of a building, and that a talented architect can continue that life and embellish it mm -hmm. and turn it into something perhaps even greater than it began. Brad, you're I, I, th I think that um, the discussion of the approach alone moves uh, the, the dialogue forward. And I think that the more people who find out about the L.A. LaDuke and, and William Morris and Ruskin, mm -hmm. the more we're going to be able to balance how we feel in America about our architectural evolution. In, interesting, uh, in the early days of the National Register, the classifications of buildings in a district were historic, non-historic, and intrusion. <laughs> and I think that that category of intrusion might need to be revisited. Now that uh, the classification of buildings is contributing and non-contributing, and the intrusion classification disappeared. Although I think we all know what an intrusive building is. So, Maybe that gets closer to an Americanized version of Leduc. I don't, I don't know, but it's a, it's a great point of departure. Those of you who are interested, the two great uh, theoreticians of preservation in the 19th century were John Ruskin and Viollet Le Duc. They came up with opposite views, and in fact, all of their views are still very much in debate today. That is an ongoing thing. I don't think it will ever be resolved. And my sense is that one has to really judge these things on a case-by-case -case basis, because significance is always site-specific. And there might be a building where John Ruskin's idea of don't touch it is the right one. And there might be a building where uh, Villa Leduc's idea of evolution and contribution is the right idea. If it's, uh, you know, it really depends on where the significance lies. Obviously, you don't want to mess things up or, or reduce the significance. So, uh, but what we need is standards and guidance that help us to make those judgments. I think we've probably gotten to the end of our session. I'm not sure. We've, I think we're supposed to stop. Are we supposed to stop? Oh, well, we, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not in a hurry to go, so if there's another question. Yes, sir, in the back. You, yes. <laughs> Come, if, if you would, if afterwards, if you would come up and pick up some of this material and get in touch with the National Alliance, their goal is to bring those advisory boards up to a regulatory level with a bit more teeth. Mm -hmm. Yes? You, you mean like an infill site, that something was demolished before designation and then it's available for redevelopment. I think there have been new urbanist plans for infill. For example, Providence, Rhode Island, the downtown plan, did, uh, did that. It, uh, it took a lot of vacant sites or underdeveloped sites and proposed uh, building footprints and massing for those sites. John, do you know of some others that have done that? I don't know that those were historic districts. <laughs> 
They may or may not have been. I think in Providence they did involve historic districts or, you know, on boundaries of them or something like and that. And there, there are a few districts that um, flip their grids <laughs> um, ra rather than, than having a downtown fill up and then have leapfrog development and sprawl at the edge. They doubled the size of the grid so that they could have development closer to town center. Mm -hmm. So I think that gets close at what you were saying, but that's not, it's more about it being historic than before it was known as historic. Yes, ma'am. But that's, I think that's a great question. Um, building on this gentleman's question, which is our, every city wants what you want. Um, John, I noticed that one of your things said incentives, and another thing said guidelines. Mm -hmm. Uh, to go back, um, uh, we're having a debate in Orange County, New York, uh, not in historic districts, about uh, form-based codes versus uh, uh, guidelines. Guidelines are something that um, an advisory body uses to judge work, and their judgments are entirely dependent on their judgment, I mean, their own judgment, their expertise, their experience, et cetera. So that um, Orange County is where they just decided, they've been debating whether or not to tear down the government center designed by Paul Rudolph. Mm -hmm. And, um, uh, you know, when you have an advisory board made up of architects who are typical of today's architects, they will argue against traditional design and for the, the architecture of time that we've been talking about. And so the advantage of a code is that um, the advisory board is taken out of the process. Uh, it says, you know, set back this amount, do this roof pitch, do windows like that, et cetera, and there's no judgment involved in that. Um, the incentive was, um, um, in the case of Damariscada, there was a limited amount that, they, that the town was willing to do, although they're willing to do more than some towns. But there was also uh, people in the town who, who wanted to go further, and so they said, let's have these incentives in which um, if a, um, a, a developer does not have to agree to use the incentives, but if he uses the incentives, we will speed up the permitting process. So there's a reward, as it were. Yeah, there's a reward, reward for, for good behavior. For using the incentives. And then the guidelines were stuff that some people in the town wanted that there was no way the voters were going to pass. But they were just put in the document as, um, if you're interested, here's how you do it. You know, Asher Benjamin actually was responsible for some of the houses in your town, and here's what he said about how to do it. Hmm. And so it was put there for those who wanted to learn. I, I think the interweaving of those tools might be best in some situations where incentives might not work, regulation is there as a safety net. Where regulation and incentives might not work together, education can be there. But it takes a warm body and an office <laughs> in order to make those things work. So I think uh, whether it's an appointed board, a town planner, or a, a, a very gifted uh, elected official, you've, you, you've got to mm -hmm. pick and choose. And, may, and maybe a hybrid mm -hmm. version of those three would work. Yeah, I think a lot depends on the place, too, because, I mean, there are, there are some places that are so sensitive that you really want someone with expertise or a group of people with real expertise to come in there and help people make decisions because any, you know, any sort of false move could really diminish the quality of a district. I'm thinking of places of just tremendous historic value that nobody would disagree, you know, and everybody wants to get it right. 
Uh, another community might be a historic district. It might be a, a neighborhood that has a lot of character, but it's maybe more, uh, more robust. It's more versatile. It's, it, it, could, it, it can absorb change much more easily than one of these quite, you know, uh, precisely, uh, you know, uh, valued places. So, you know, maybe a more flexible program in a place like that. Uh, Charleston has a board of architectural review, and every project gets picked at and picked at and picked at by the Board of Architectural Review. Um, and, you know, obviously there's a diversity of opinion about how effective that is. Uh, uh, I was just talking to an architect in Coral Gables the other day, uh, the town I grew up in, and I, uh, I haven't lived there for the last, you know, 50, 40 years. But um, looking at the change, I've been back several times, it, the changes, I said to this uh, architect who had been before the Board of Architects there, which is composed, I think uniquely, of only architects. So every architect is going in front of his competitors who, who then have to approve his, his or her design. Uh, and so I asked this architect, I said, well, do you think over time the Board of Architects has, uh, has helped pr you know, prevent worse development than we actually have? He said, no. Actually, I think it would have been better if there hadn't been an architectural review board in Carl Gables. And I had to look around and say, well, you know, if this is what they approved, I'd have to say, I can't imagine it could be much worse without them. Uh, so you have to really look at the place, its sensitivity. You have to figure out what is the right expertise to bring. I think multidisciplinary boards are better than having only architects, especially the, it's like putting the fox in charge of the hen house, frankly, to have a bunch of modernist architects on your board. Um, another question, or oh, John, do you want to say something? Somebody used the word crazy earlier. You know, one of the crazy things about this is that um, many of these districts were set up to prevent change. And then the advisory board demands change. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and, you know, the process of setting up the district gave the advisory board the power to demand change. But in New York City, in 1961, um, New York City passed new zoning, and within six months, there were something like 16 new districts that basically said, we don't want that zoning. To prevent the zoning that they had just passed from being and carried out. And now there are 160-something special districts in New York City, mm -hmm. and almost every one of them is the local neighborhood saying, we don't want the zoning. And, uh, you know, so it's, it is a crazy process. Well, here's a thought that I'd like to leave everybody with today. Um, what started out as a reactive, defensive movement, and historic preservation certainly in the beginning when we witnessed the, well, I didn't personally, but when we witnessed, uh, let's say metaphorically, the destruction of Pennsylvania Station, when we witnessed the destruction of vast neighborhoods under urban renewal, when we saw you know, uh, thousands of people displaced and so on, there was a, obviously a, a need to react against that. And one of the ways to react against it is to say you can't do that. You know, in, within these boundaries, you can't do that. Um, one of the unfortunate consequences is that more recently, people have used historic district uh, tools as a way of, as John said, preventing change. I mean, Paul Goldberger said, uh, nowadays, you know, people will preserve anything, no matter how questionable it is. You know, some, you know, shack in the back on, on an alley will be designated because they're afraid of so what someone might build there. So, as a preemptive strike, this sort of preemptive preservation to prevent something worse from happening is certainly a tool that has been very effective in a lot of areas, but it now raises the question at where we are now. There's got to be something more than simply preventing what we fear. There has to be something positive. There has to be an aspirational aspect. And I think this is something that is really on the cutting edge in preservation now, is to say, well, in addition to trying to stop what we fear, is there some way that preservationists could point out what we want? What kind of environment would we, in fact, like to see happen? And that, that goes for new urbanism, too, because new urbanism, in a way, is part of that. It's saying, well, not only do we want to stop the bad kind of development, but we have an idea or two about how to make good development. And so it seems to me that if we could imagine a traditional architectural practice a new urbanist practice and a historic preservation practice all lined up behind a kind of common ethic or common aspiration for what kind of city we want, then we're going to see some real change. But I think we really have to move beyond the kind of defensive mode. Yes, sir. Uh, 
Imagine if they felt that way about their dentist. Yeah, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like, I'm going into a heart surgeon, yeah, right. but I really don't, I don't trust my surgeon. Trust any of those guys to give me a better heart than the one I already have. Right. So I That's good. I like, I'm going to use that. May I? Yeah. Well, you just, have to, you just have to get involved and you have to try to work for change the best way you can. Yes, ma'am, you had your hand up. It varies from state to state, but the, the Democratic Quasi-Judicial Design Review Board, because of the Supreme Court decision, really is the preferred way to go in most states because of enabling legislation. There's little variation that some local governments can have because the state has enabled only a certain kind of design review board, so they are bound by state legislation quite often. Uh, and I'd like to respond mm -hmm, to what, what was just hinted at, is that in, in creating boards who don't want to see inappropriate change, it's odd that our land use controls and our property controls, the only way that they can get involved, the trigger that brings them into action is proposed change. Mm. So the very thing that allows them to make a decision might be what created them in the first place not <laughs> to happen. So square peg, round hole. Mm -hmm. Any I, other? I have yes, a, John. I have a form-based code talk I give that starts off, uh, the first slide says, if you're going to plan your town, why not plan a town you like? Right. At, which is not what zoning does. That's right. Well, this raises the sort of is another side of the question I raised earlier. Can we be positive and proactive? In other words, instead of saying we want to defend against the bad thing, um, it's a little difficult because most historic preservation programs and commissions don't have the staff or budget to actually do more than simply identify uh, vulnerable sites. They don't have the, what Nantucket did. They can't go out and write a, a master plan for their town saying these are our most important resources and this is the way we want to see new growth. Uh, would that they could. In the United Kingdom, they do that. Um, every conservation area is required to have a plan for the future of that conservation area, meaning not just how you're going to save the listed buildings, but how are you going to allow new buildings to be built that don't destroy the area. With, with a trained conservation officer. Yes, you have to, yeah, and that's sometimes good and sometimes not so good because it depends on sort of what ideology they bring to the job. But what, uh, with the good officers, what it means is that there is, there's actually a tool that would allow the, 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 the area, the neighborhood, to not only prevent the, inf uh, the development they don't want, but to actually plan for what they do want. So here's an example of urban planning and architecture and preservation, again, converging to actually create a, a positive vision of the future of that place. And to, and yes, sir. I was just going to comment on that because I worked for many years in the, in the UK. Yes. 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 And not just as single art objects, yes. which is sometimes 
Right. To get the bit part of an overall street scene. And um, for me, I think the, the most successful conservation projects are the ones that have a townscape approach to them. Mm -hmm. I think it's a very comfortable relationship between that sort of conservation and the European It's the tout ensemble again. It's a, it's yeah. a big townscape approach. John. Uh, to go back to your question, uh, a form based code is locally calibrated. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's absolutely nothing to prevent, and it's most likely that, a, that the calibration will include local historical standards. Mm -hmm. And when there is actually a historic district, it's easy to include those mm -hmm. in the form based code. I mentioned uh, West Palm Beach right here uh, as an example that I don't know if any of you have been able to walk around City Place, but uh, look for the older buildings that are kind of embedded in the new development. There's a reason why they're still there. Uh, and it has to do with the way that the form-based code actually incorporated them and made it possible for them to, to remain. Uh, I think we probably should clear the room, but I want to thank you all very much for your active participation. Thank you.